So we're going live on YouTube with our Earth Month teachings on the issues and opportunities we've discovered in our community. Great, all set. So welcome everybody to our uh, Earth Month set of teachings. We've got actually four topics to share with you today uh, and from our variety of groups. There's one individual project from our solo grad students in the practicum course here tonight. Um, so that said, I should tell you who you're going to hear from. First of all, from me a little bit. Uh, my name is Krista Bailey. I uh, teach in the sustainability studies program at IU South Bend. Uh, and these are students in the sustainability practicum. So students majoring or minoring in sustainability studies. Uh, it is a combined class. We bring our graduate students and undergraduates together. This year, weirdly enough, we only have one graduate student completing their certificates. We've got one graduate student who's here uh, who had some uh, extra uh, special work as a graduate student in the program. Uh, so that's what's going on. We've uh, been working on projects um, aligning with the needs of our community, uh, what those sustainability challenges are and how they can be addressed. So really kind of pulling together all the um, theory and practice and knowledge and ideas we've been working on throughout their sustainability curriculum and putting it into practice. Uh, so. Uh, we started out the semester, of course, very differently than where we are now. Uh, we were hoping to be able to take these teach-ins right to our community partners out into the community or invite people to campus to hear them live and face-to-face. -face. So next best thing, live on YouTube. Uh, and then we can always come back and see the videos later if we need to. So uh, we're gonna be hearing uh, four teach-ins. Uh, so these are designed um, with the idea of those original teach-ins that launched the first Earth Day 50 years ago, um, it was really, uh, Earth Day was set up to raise awareness about um, environmental challenges primarily and how we can respond to them. And it led to the passage of Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, the EPA was established all within just a couple, two, three years um, because of this groundswell of information and inspiration to respond. Uh, so we're embracing that concept here tonight to share some issues and opportunities uh, with the rest of you. That said, if you have questions and you would like to post them in the chat. I'll be watching uh, in the device uh, by my side uh, so we can see what questions you might have. We'd love to answer them. Otherwise, we're just going to talk to one another because we have been all semester and it's awesome, good fun. Uh, so I'm going to stop talking now and let the class introduce themselves to you and then we'll get started uh, with the first group. So looking on my screen, I'm going to ask, uh, let's see, Bailey, why don't you introduce why yourself? Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Bailey Richner. Um, I'm a sustainability minor and I graduate in about a week and a half. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, looks like I've got Allison up next. Hi guys, my name is Allison Zaharsky and I'm about to graduate from the Sustainability Studies program. Fantastic, uh, next up for me is Ashley. Hi guys, I'm Ashley Four. I am also going to be graduating um, with a sustainability minor and a major in communications. A powerful combination. Uh, next up, our solo, brave, lone graduate student, Tony. Hi, my name's Tony Bush, and I'm I have one more semester in uh, grad school. So close. Uh, next up on my screen uh, is Abby. Hello everyone, my name is Abby Utterback and I'm a senior. I finished in the fall uh, in the Sustainability Studies program with Environmental Studies minor. Another awesome combination. Uh, coming up next is Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah. I'm a major in communications and a minor in sustainability and I'm about to graduate. Yay, it's such an exciting time. All right, uh, 
one person's not about to graduate, but she'll introduce herself anyway, because she's been a great part of the class and the team. That's Maureen. Hi, everybody. My name is Maureen Grimison, and I'm a sustainability major at IUSB. And Krista stole my joke, but I was going to say I'm the only one who's not graduating anytime soon. But here I am. <laughs> So we get to keep you for a little while, which is awesome. Uh, coming up next, I see River. Hi, everyone. I'm River Watson, sustainability ma major and environmental science minor, and I'll be graduating in December. Wonderful. Coming up, no relation to me, but has an awesome last name, and that would be Trace. Hello, my name is Trace. I'm a sustainability major and I will be graduating in December as well. And I don't see his face yet, but I see next up on my screen is Josh. Hi everyone, um, I'm Josh Tijoki and I am a sustainability min or major and environmental science minor. And I can graduate also in December. So this class is obviously going to have something like holiday New Year's graduation bash, uh, which will be awesome. Uh, last up, I see Amanda. Hey guys, my name is Amanda Lau, and I also am a sustainability major and environmental studies minor, also graduating in December. Yay. All right. Well, that is um, that is everybody. Uh, and we've got uh, represented here tonight. Um, we've got three team based uh, projects that will be sharing out one solo project. Uh, so we'll be hearing about those uh, in a moment. Uh, before we get in, I do want to give a big uh, thank you to all the members of the community that either came to our classroom um, or uh, hosted us in the community so we could hear from them about what they do and how they do it, um, why they do it and how that matters. So um, we uh, give a big shout out to Dr. K on the IU South Bend campus talking with us about what we would hope to do for Earth Day this year, live and in person. Uh, we also met with um, Kelly Hofferth from Michiana Veg Fest, um, which has been postponed till the fall. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, we'd hope to connect with DTSB, but a non-virus related illness that prevented that, but uh, appreciate uh, his willingness to, to meet with us as well. That would be uh, Director Milt Lee. Uh, we also talked with several people at the NNN neighborhood. Um, so Kathy Shu, the director there. We also met with uh, Mike Keen, who lives in the neighborhood, um, retired professor from IU South Bend in the sustainability program, uh, uh, talking about the work he's doing with his um, business called Thrive Michiana. Uh, and we also got to talk with the director of South Bend's Office of Sustainability, Therese Duro. So appreciate hearing from all of them and uh, the good work that they're doing, uh, which really inspired uh, the work you're going to hear about tonight in large part. Uh, so that said, uh, it's time to pull up our first presentation, uh, and that is on edible horticulture. Uh, so as I begin to pull up the um, material on the screen, I will let someone or everyone on that team uh, take a moment to preface it, like what it is, what to expect, why they did it. So it's Bailey again. Uh, I'm part of the team BART, as we are known. <laughs> uh, my name is Abby. My I'm name is Abby. I'm the other portion. The other portion. <laughs> And I'm River, and I'll be also a part of this team, Bart. And I am Trace, and I'm also the last member of this team, Bart. Um, and we chose the topic of edible horticulture after meeting with the NNN during our semester. Um, and just hearing a 
brief tidbit about how they have interest in doing some work with edible horticulture in their community and their neighborhood and we wanted to build upon that because it's something that we all had interest in. Awesome. Thank you for introducing that. Um, so I'm looking on our class blog. It's got reflections from throughout the semester posted by the students if you want to peruse that. Um, but it's also the landing page for all of the teach-ins we've got tonight. So we're starting here with the edible horticulture presentation, which I will pull up and get started for you. And uh, again, we'll take questions as they're posted in the chat um, after this presentation. Hey, Krista, we can't hear it. I think because you're muted or I'm not really sure. Lastly, it's less plastic and package waste. When you go to a store to buy your food, it's always going to be coming in covered in plastic or in a box of some sort that is just not needed when, you're, when you can just grow it at home. So in terms of uh, beginning this goal of implementing edible horticulture to address food access and food insecurity in Indiana, we have chosen to begin this initiative in, in the near Northwest neighborhood because they have a lot of existing sustainable beliefs. Um, at first we begin to, we chose to begin with community outreach as the first step. Uh, this was done through creating an informational graphic that conveys uh, what what food to grow, when to grow it, and uh, lists a few of the triple bottom line benefits that edible horticulture provides for individuals as well as their whole community. Uh, we plan to administer this infographic on 
the website of the Near Northwest, on their Facebook page, as well as in the community centers of the neighborhood and at the local coffee shop called The Local Cup. This is the infographic that our group has prepared for the Near Northwest to support edible horticulture in the community. Uh, we start out by addressing how, why not, why not just go local, grow local, um, and how that is helpful to the community and consumers, and as well as the information. Um, secondly, after hopefully sparking some interest in the idea of growing our own, some one's own food, we hope to implement a seed bank into the neighborhood to support this endeavor of edible horticulture throughout the future. Um, seed banks help to provide reliable and convenient access to seeds. If communities are already struggling to, to get healthy, fresh food, it might not be as easy to obtain seeds either. Um, and a seed bank also helps provide access to food during potential times of like climate change or season changings or floods or droughts in the community that we did see last year. Um, it also supports community involvement through getting people to come together at the seed bank and exchange seeds, exchange conversation, perhaps methods of gardening, or just spark conversation about what they like to garden. Um, and perhaps one of the most important aspects of seed banks is to encourage food sovereignty in communities. Uh, food sovereignty is known as the right to be aware of and have a choice in food production and origin. This has become a concern um, in our global food system as most foods are processed and transported and sprayed with God knows what. Um, so food sovereignty is the practice of trying to take back that control and grow your own food and know where it comes from and everything that's included in it. Be able to name the ingredients on the back of the box, essentially, is kind of what that means. So why is edible horticulture important? Well, there are several benefits to having edible horticulture in your community. It will provide the community a positive return on their investment. One of the biggest is the cost savings members will have on produce. By growing their own food, they will be able to produce on average 40 pounds over the length of the season. Now, while that may not seem like a lot, if you can envision five gallon uh, like buckets that you would get at like Home Depot, Envision four of those full of produce that you grew yourself. That's how much you get over the course of the growing season. And that will save um, the residents up to $50 annually, which may not seem like a lot, but when money is tight, $50 can make all the difference. Another benefit that edible horticulture will provide will be increasing the property values. Having edible horticulture in the community will raise property values by as much as 9.4%. Uh, the average property value in South Bend is around $111,000. So increasing that by 9.4% will add $10,000 to a property's value or make it around $121,000. Another benefit of edible horticulture is how it can bring the community together. Since this will be a community funded effort, people will work with one another to help grow their produce. People may even uh, start to have competitions for best looking gardens. The residents in the community will also have access to fresh local produce, something they have not had before. This in itself will be a great return on investment, not only for residents' health, but for the sense of well-being as well. Though this project may not have a physically financial return on investment, it will greatly affect and change the quality and livelihood of residents in the community, which is a return on investment in itself. So what can you do to help? One of the first things you can do is start by growing your own food. It doesn't have to start with a lot. You can start with simple things such as tomatoes or zucchini or other small uh, produce. Start with the goal of uh, having a small productive garden in the first year and get bigger gardens over the years to come. Uh, other things you can do is you can also share the infographic we created that you saw earlier. That way others can see the kinds of things they can grow at what time of year as well as the benefits of growing their fresh produce themselves. What you can do does not just have to be limited to yourself. Reach out to others and help them get started with their own gardens. Gardening can be a great community effort if everyone puts their time and effort into it. Uh, thank you for watching our presentation. Hey, very cool. So as we wait for folks on YouTube to kind of process this, I know we're in a little bit of a delay. Um, I did have a question. I thought that was a really interesting data shared at the end. Um, 
about the return on the investment for edible horticulture, but I'm curious about how, how it raises property values, partly because some of you know I, I, I plant edible stuff in my front yard. <laughs> so it'd be a nice um, counterpoint to share with my neighbors who don't. Um, how, how does edible horticulture help raise a property value? So, wait, um, so the research that I found it just the reason that it raises it just because it serves as like a beautification for like the uh, there we go the uh, housing and the areas around it so it will just like in that way improve it. So my neighborhood does these contests. I thought you guys had a really neat idea about this. They always, it's sort of unofficial. They just post it sometime in the summer and they're like, so-and-so had the best yard this year. Um, so I don't know how to nominate it. <laughs> I've never won. Um, <laughs> but um, I love that idea of having an edible horticulture recognition award or something like who can uh, incorporate it the best or produce the most or whatever it might be. Have you heard of neighborhoods that, that do this? And, and if so, where, where are they? How, who can we learn from about this? I'm pretty sure the near Northwest neighborhood does something like that. I know they do a plant swap where um, you go and then you can swap plants with other people. But I'm pretty sure they, I don't know if it's so much of a contest, but people do try to take more pride in their yards and um, to show their community and to meet other community members, like, look how fancy my yard is. And then I'm pretty sure they do that. I saw on their website. So this could just be like sort of an added feature that they build in or expand on. So yeah, contest, but for edible things instead of <laughs> flowers. <laughs> Flowers are cool, but <laughs> you can eat some of them. <laughs> um, so I think I, sorry, it was one of the viewers said, oh, I had the same question that I already asked, but I have another question from, from viewers um, and that is uh, the seed bank. They think that's a great idea. Um, but uh, the question is, do you have to collect seeds every year uh, to keep them fresh or there's things that maybe last longer? I mean, is this like an annual replenishment? Can you talk a little bit about um, deposits in the seed bank? I don't know anything about how long seeds last. I guess I've never, maybe Trace does because he's our farmer. But um, I was just, un I would think that it'd be rotating so much with people taking and giving that it wouldn't be as much of a problem as making them last a while. I think also um, making it noted to gather seeds from the things that you're growing would be like important to note for the seed bank to keep it replenished and keep it from not going dry because then it would be convenient and easy to do so um, once there's already like a base point there. Any other questions or comments from the class for this group? I know we've been hearing a little bit about it for some time now. So um, questions, comments, feedback? Or do any of you guys grow your own food <laughs> too? I'd like to grow my own food. Um, I tried it before, I'm not good at it. So there's that. <laughs> I wish I could in an apartment, I would. I like grow herbs and like uh, like root vegetables, but that's that's it.
Well, Ashley, maybe you can try my uh, my mom's approach to uh, edible horticulture and plant the giant okra plant <laughs> to decorate your yard. Maybe I, I just looked like it up. It's, it's pretty. <laughs> All right, everyone's just stunned by your presentation. So nothing to add or questions to ask, which is great. Um, so I'm just gonna let it, uh, we'll just roll right into the next presentation. Uh, so that is on uh, zero waste. Uh, so as I get that pulled up, does um, anyone or does the group, uh, would you like to give us a little introduction to this? Um, so we uh, did our teaching about um, zero waste living uh, and trying to begin that if you don't already do it. Allison uh, is already living that way. So um, she was able to really help us um, get some ideas on this one. Well, great. Well, let's uh, get it started. virtual teach-in about zero waste living. My name is Amanda and soon you'll be hearing from my colleagues Josh, Ashley, and Allison. We're all students enrolled in the Indiana University South Bend Sustainability Program. Each one of us comes from a very different background, yet we all share the same passion for living as waste-free as possible. I will now pass it over to Josh who will talk to you more about the five R's of zero waste living. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot or composting. 
So I'm going to be talking about how to start living waste free and this includes how to reduce, how to reuse upcycle and also how to recycle, how to compost and how to tell the difference between what can go in the recycling bin and what should go in the trash can. Um, so one way that you can reduce is by reducing the amount of tr uh, trash that you put in the trash can so the amount of stuff that goes to the landfill um, this can be done by composting composting is creating a basically an area where food scraps yard clippings and things like that can go into this area and it can help the soil grow it can introduce new biodiversity to the ecosystem um, it can help take away waste that would go to the landfill and put it into um, you know a sustainable reusable environment um, and so that's about composting that's something that usually not more advanced people do but something like recycling and reusing is something that anyone can do. Um, so for recycling, 87% of citizens in the U.S. are able to have their recycling picked up curbside, and this includes South Bend and St. Joseph County. So on the web, on the St. Joe County website, there is a page where it talks about their recycling and the uh, mapping of the areas that they cover, the routes that they take, and the times that they do the recycling. Um, so anyone that's local and is looking interested in recycling should definitely check out the St. Joseph website recycle uh, recycling website and then there are also multiple local recycling companies that also do curbside pickups um, and so utilize, utilizing trash removal and recycling services can help you manage your waste effectively and that can help you reduce the amount of waste that you are putting back into the landfill um, and so uh, sometimes telling the difference between what can go in the landfill and what can go into the uh, recycling bin is hard, but a lot more stuff than people think can be recycled. So paper, cardboard, um, glass, things like that can all be recycled. Things that would go in the land, uh, into the trash can ending up in the landfill would be like cat litter, you know, broken glass, uh, things that it would be more difficult to try to sort them out at the sorting facilities. It's easier um, and it saves time to just put those into the trash can and have those picked up by the um, trash removal services. And then um, reusing plastic bags when you're going shopping, um, using Tupperware when you're packing food or leftovers. Those are also things that people can do. So that's a, those are little steps that anyone can take to start reducing um, their you know footprint, start living waste free, start um, leaning towards a zero waste lifestyle and um, start reaping the benefits of living a zero waste lifestyle. Hey everybody, I'm Ashley, and I'm going to be talking about the uh, the cons of waste-free living. Uh, we do know that it is a great way to live. However, it can be hard to start um, and continue going on. So a couple of the the cons are that it is slow and sometimes expensive to begin to live waste-free. Um, just swapping out your non-waste products can be expensive, especially if you do it all at one time. Um, I, w I guess I would recommend just swapping things out as you go. Um, just trying to do it all at once can be quite expensive. Um, also, one of the biggest things uh, that people don't think about is the produce. Uh, the stickers, rubber bands, twist ties, things like that. Um, that does not help with the waste free. You can't throw that stuff away. You can't compost it. You can't do anything like that. Um, well, you throw them away, but you don't want to do that. Um, so to avoid those types of things, you would need to go to a farmer's market, um, which not everybody has access to. Uh, we are lucky here in South Bend that we have access to a local farmer's market, but some people just don't have that access. Um, another thing 
is prepping food that you would normally buy already prepared at a grocery store is time consuming. It could take hours, days um, to produce the same amount of an item that uh, for what you would buy at the store. So, uh, for example, so if you wanted to make hummus, you think hummus sounds like a good snack, um, but it's gonna take you a long time, especially if you get the dried chickpeas, you have to rehydrate them. You have to get all of the ingredients and that can be expensive as well. Um, so it's not just time consuming, it can uh, be costly, it takes time to swap out your, uh, your wasteful products for non-wasteful products. Um, but there are easy steps as well. And um, now we're gonna hear from Allison about ways to start taking this seriously and going zero waste. Thank you. Hey guys, for our teaching, I will be contributing some beginner tips for living a more minimal or zero waste lifestyle. My first tip goes along with reducing your overall food waste. I think that it is important to stray away from buying items in plastic packaging, especially when there are resources available in our area to help eliminate that. For items like spices, beans, rice, or pasta, I choose to buy these items um, at a store that has access to bulk bins. You can find bulk bins at Whole Foods, Fresh Time, and Purple Porch Co-op here in town. Um, buying more fresh produce that is unpackaged is also essential when going zero waste. Um, so like apples or onions or potatoes, I buy singularly, singularly and not in um, a bunch because it's also important to only buy what you need and half the time when you buy a whole bag of onions or when you buy a whole bag of potatoes you don't actually use all of it you end up throwing some of that away or else uh it goes bad before you can use it um i also think that quitting fast fashion is also crucial when going zero waste when you need something whether it be a pair of shoes kitchenware or linens you should always try to find these items secondhand before buying them new um, some of my favorite items that i have purchased have all been secondhand and I have been wearing them um, you or slash using them for years and um, those are some of my favorite items that I wear but I'm also not contributing to um, fast fashion as well. So another way to go zero waste is to take a look at your toiletries. There are several swaps that you can make um, in regards to your toiletries um, such as a bamboo toothbrush, um, tooth tabs um, or a uh, shampoo bar um, and that will ultimately cut down your overall waste. Also, I think that DIYing items can help not only in terms of waste, but it can also save you um, some money in the long run too. For example, many beauty products can be um, made at home for the fraction of the price that you would pay for them in a store. I choose to DIY my um, own all-purpose cleaner, for example. Um, I use vinegar and I use orange peels to help clean my home naturally without chemicals and without also all of the plastic patch packaging that comes along with uh, the majority of cleaning products. Using a reusable water bottle instead of um, buying plastic bottles is also essential. Choosing to make coffee at home, which is typically what I do, but sometimes if you do want to go out and order a latte from a local coffee shop, whatever, um, bring a reusable coffee cup. Um, usually this can get you a discount. I know like at Starbucks and uh, Chicory here downtown where I live, um, you can get a discount for bringing your own cup. Also, saying no to straws altogether, because I don't necessarily think that really anyone needs to be drinking out of a straw, but um, saying no to straws altogether or bring your own bamboo or stainless steel straw um, to restaurants, etc. Um, also, bring reusable bags to the market so you're not using um, plastic bags. Um, and this also goes for produce bags as well. Um, composting your own food scraps. I live in an apartment, so it's kind of hard to do this, uh, but I do have a countertop 
um, composting bin that I do put my food scraps in and it works well. I'm also a house plant lover, so I put all of that excess food waste in as nutrients for my house plants and they absolutely thrive on that. Um, also, I think it's important to grow your own food and herbs. Um, like I said, I do live in an apartment and I know a lot of other 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 people live in an apartment as well um so it's kind of hard to grow entirely your own food so i choose to grow um, my own herbs um this is a basil plant that i have but i do have a lot of others um in my kitchen that i do grow and use for cooking and then also knowing that you cannot do it all i think it goes without saying that zero waste was actually made for um companies when reducing um, their overall uh, waste. It wasn't actually made for individuals. So I think it's important to note that the zero waste lifestyle is not perfect. We do not live in a society that um, it can be perfect. So just doing the best that you can and knowing that you're making a difference with those small um, steps is really important. Okay, well, that sets us right up for questions, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, um, any questions from the class? We'll start there as we let folks catch up with us online. I have one. Um, first, uh, I want to commend you for composting while you live in an apartment, Allison. That's pretty impressive that you don't even like have to do it outside. Um, but uh, my question is kind of about either places to get started doing a zero waste lifestyle or recommendations to live as zero waste as you can during this quarantine with like limited resources and things. Like, do you have any idea as to how that would be best done? Well, I know like right now, um, as far as like bringing your own containers to the store, that's like really frowned upon. And there's like signs everywhere. It's like, don't bring your own reusable bags and so on and so forth. Um, but um, for like produce, I actually order from an online website um, called misfitsmarket.com. Um, and every, you can choose every week or bi-weekly imperfect produce um, sent to your door. So I think that's, that's one thing, yeah. I have a question. So what did you find to be the most challenging as far as uh, living zero waste? Is that a question for me? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I should have said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would definitely say uh, the perception that other people have who don't live zero waste think probably think that a lot of the things that I do are, I don't know, gross, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know a lot of people have a stigma of like buying secondhand things in general, but I wish there wasn't a stigma, but I've been told that before. So I would think that would be the most difficult. And then obviously right now, not being able to use your own container uh, like go out but other than that yeah so I'm going to jump in and follow up a little bit um so last night a, a graduate seminar had some teach-ins um that had uh, some overlapping resources that might be helpful one about um composting in an apartment uh so on our this uh, youtube channel you can find uh, that teaching it's about vermicomposting so using worms uh for composting and it can be done in a, a small bin that can fit under your sink or in your basement or wherever um that will allow you to compost without having uh to to do it outside so check that out it was very interesting um and there was um Last week, the same class was talking about this um, uh, concept of, of plastic bags, right? Reducing the plastic bags. So Josh made the point of, hey, um, you can reuse them. Like that's a first step. And I thought that was really great to hear um, because you know, you can't, tomorrow I'm going zero waste. 
that's just, that's a lot to think about. Um, but starting to reduce um, by reusing things, I thought was a great tip. Um, and one thing that came up with the, the class from last week about plastic um, and, uh, and it relates to some questions that are coming in too, uh, but I'll kind of preface it here. And that's that uh, because you can't, it's frowned upon to bring your own bag to the store um, in many places. Um, but there's some workarounds. And the one that uh, I, myself and several others just thought was brilliant was going into the grocery store um, and you know they want to put it in the plastic bag that's been sitting in the store with people breathing on it, which I don't understand how it's cleaner, but apparently it is. Um, instead of doing that, just have them put it back in your cart. Take the cart out to your car or outside, bag it up, uh, and you're good. Um, or just put it right in the car uh, for that matter. But I thought that was brilliant. I never, I don't know why that seems like such a simple thing. Like you put it in the cart to take it to the register. Can't you put it back in the cart as is to take to your car? Um, so that's something that one uh, person had suggested as a way to, to reduce and, and be zero waste at the grocery store. Um, but I'm gonna turn to some questions that are coming in from our viewers. So if you guys have questions, hold on to them for a second. So let's see, what's the first one? Oh yeah, um, so a lot of places that used to let you bring in reusable cups um, and bags um, don't allow them because of health concerns. Uh, do you guys have any tips for this? I know that I saw, um, I think walking into Meyer, um, that you know you can't use the reusable bags unless it's like you're, um your shipped shopper so like if you don't want to go to the store anyway because of all of this and you order your groceries from shipped they won't be using the plastic bags they'll, they'll have their reusable bags so that was one thing i had thought about um that i had seen and as for cups i feel like that's just gonna have to be something you'll have to sacrifice not getting coffee or whatever you're using to refill. Um, maybe that's just a sacrifice you have to make for the time being. I'm sorry, Krista, I didn't hear the whole question because you cut out on my end. Sure, uh, the question's about um, because of health restrictions right now for reusable cups um, and bring in your own bags. Um, for people that are interested in reducing their waste or living zero waste, do you guys have any tips um, faced, when we're faced with these sort of health limitations on, on reducing waste? I'm um, going along with uh, what Ashley said about uh, the reusable cups. I mean, really the best option, the zero, best zero waste option for that is just making like coffee at home. So personally, um, I usually just go out to get like coffee, like as a treat anyway. So having to wait longer, I mean, really doesn't do anything to me. <laughs> I'll look forward to it, but I don't know when that will be. So until then, I will make my coffee at home. Uh, another question was, um, have any companies achieved or, or are they models for zero waste that we could look to to see what that means and how they do it? Um, I hadn't looked, personally, I hadn't looked at any of that, but I did just kind of quickly looked it up. Um, Subaru was actually a company that's trying to go zero waste and it says that they reuse and recycle everything which is not really surprising I guess coming from Subaru and, and Toyota but I don't know if any uh, anybody else knows other companies
Okay, well, how about this question also from uh, viewers is, um, have any of the students decided to go zero waste given what you have learned? I definitely have, I've minimized my own personal waste. Um, I live with a family of five, of family of five one, so they generate a lot of waste. So I try to kind of have some influence. Um, even like uh, during this quarantine with, my family's always used like giant refillable water jugs, um, but they're not accepting those right now. So my dad went to buying bottled water and I was like, oh, like I literally couldn't drink water because of the guilt. So I was like, can we get um, those, like the uh, jugs that you put uh, faucet water in and then it filters as you pour. So, I mean, I've just been trying to have influences on my family more. Um, but I definitely, uh, this presentation was super compelling to even like up my ante, so. Yeah, I agree with Abby. After this presentation, I feel more motivated, but even before just um, taking sustainability classes, uh, I've noticed that I look, or I think about things longer before purchasing and um, just even in my own house or if, when I'm hanging out, people are like, oh no, I can't do that. Like, I don't want to create more waste. <laughs> so I've been just, even with the class, I've been more thoughtful of it. My family and I, um, we try to do things that are less wasteful, but I have two young children and they waste a lot of things. So it's, that's a little tricky, but we do try and, just even trying to do little things, um, I think is beneficial. Um, start with baby steps because if you try and do it all at once, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah, that's a great point, Ashley. I remember feeling very torn about that when my kids were, were little too, like, God, there's so much stuff <laughs> that just, you know, food and toys and whatever. Um, but the little things were really important. I remember feeling like especially proud parent moment when my son was like, I don't know, four or five and he held up something. Can I recycle this? And we had, you know, everything he had before he did anything with it, he'd ask. And I'm like, well, here's how you find out what you look for. And, and so, and then we, that moved on to discussions of like, boy, this is trash. Why did we buy it in this container? And then we had those discussions. And so it, it was like a progression through as they grew up. Um, to, to be thinking about that more. So there's hope, <laughs> it's trashy little kids. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you guys could clarify, um, I think it was Ashley's section that was like, oh, it can be really expensive when you were showing the cons of zero waste. Um, how is it expensive to go zero waste? It almost sounds counterintuitive if you're eliminating stuff that it's gonna cost more. So if you can maybe elaborate a little bit on that, um, what those costs might be. Um, I, I, I guess what I was thinking was that um, cost-wise, if you were, especially if you're trying to do everything at once and you're trying to replace items that are less, wa less wasteful, um, instead of just using what you have now and then replenishing with less wasteful items, um, also, like some of the things, I guess, could be potentially more expensive if you wanting if you're wanting to get um, particular items that are better for the environment and things like that. Um, less processed food, uh, you know. If you, I don't know. I guess just like replacing with the 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 less the products that um, are more environmentally friendly uh, sometimes can be more expensive, I guess. Yeah, while these products are more expensive, you're also buying a more quality product, though. It'll last longer, and it's obviously better for the environment. So, I mean, it is really an, an investment uh, to go zero ways. And I think that that's one of the things is this, the upfront cost of things can be a con to a lot of people that don't have a lot of money. 
Yeah, I was actually gonna give some feedback. Like I appreciated that you guys, cause at first it almost seemed like it was an all or nothing approach, but I liked how you guys dialed it back to being like, but you can do this because yeah, like it is, it makes a lot more sense to buy a reusable cup, but for somebody who only has a dollar fifty for a cup of coffee, you cannot consider buying a $25 keep cup. Like I love those. And they're so cute. And I have reusable cups. I'm obsessed with them. But I am I understand that's kind of a privilege. So I appreciate that you guys addressed that and that you made it seem like really doable. So I also feel um, motivated to take a look at my waste and um, try to reduce it for sure. Yeah, and zero waste doesn't like necessarily mean absolute zero. It's like pretty much taking your personal preferences and your lifestyle and just uh, reducing your waste and really like being conscientious conscientious of like what you're putting into the landfill and the impact that you're making on this earth. Well, you guys have given us a lot to think about. Like Bailey said, like, whoa, there's, you know, thought into everything is really the biggest first step to make. And you guys laid out some really compelling data on that to, to just think about stuff before we buy it or throw it away. Like Josh was saying, like, well, can you recycle it? Like, think about how to reuse it. Um, all those little steps. It's a really great food for thought. Um, any other uh, final comments or questions on the presentation before we move on? All right then. Uh, so it looks looks like next we've got um, Tony's presentation. Is that right? Um, dude, let me double check. Yes, on campus sustainability reporting. So would you like to say something about that as I pull up your presentation? Uh, sure. Uh, um, that um, what I did was I utilized the um, the stars or sustainability tracking assessment and rating system report. Um, from IUSB that I've been working on um, as a work study student. And I tried to um, pick out a few issues that were, um, that are manageable to um, try to improve uh, um, IUSB's uh, level of sustainability. And um, in the presentation, I, I um, have five issues that are um, possibly able to be um, addressed. Um, at varying degrees and um, yeah, the presentation will um, speak and then if you have any questions. Hello everyone. My presentation is titled Utilizing Stars to Move IU South Bend Toward a More Sustainable Future. The Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System Report, STARS, created by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, assesses the current level of sustainability on a campus. It provides a baseline that can be used to move campuses toward a more sustainable future. Based on IU South Bend's first report, Five sustainability issues have been identified relating to curriculum, campus engagement, public engagement, planning and administration, and greenhouse gas inventory. Sustainability issue one relates to curriculum. Sustainability is a growing field and has many job opportunities. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that environmental science positions will grow by 8% from 2018 to 2028. Additionally, environmental engineering technician jobs are, related, are expected to grow 9%, and urban planner jobs are expected to experience 11% growth in the same period. IU South Bend has the opportunity to add more sustainability courses to fill the increasing demand for sustainability positions that are expected to occur at least through 2028. Figure 1 shows 2% of all 
I use up in classes related to sustainability competencies. This limits students' opportunity to take sustainability courses and increases the possibility of scheduling conflicts with other courses that students may be required to take. Limited courses also challenge some students' ability to graduate on time with a sustainability degree, minor, or graduate certificate. In past years, there were two professors and one lecturer in sustainability studies. Faculty typically teach two to three courses per semester. Currently, there is one full-time sustainability lecturer position filled, limiting the number of sustainability courses that can be offered. The IU South Bend faculty and salary listing shows the average wages of faculty ranges from lecturer at $46,270 per year to professor at $91,923 per year. Adding additional faculty would provide immediate opportunity to increase the number of students interested in pursuing degrees in sustainability and increase student retention and graduation rates. Sustainability issue number two relates to campus engagement. Campus would see economic, environmental, and social benefits from a stronger sustainability campus community culture. As a commuter campus, many of the students leave campus when they are not attending their classes. Approximately 8% of the current 5,092 students are residents on campus. A stronger sustainability campus community culture will encourage students to spend more time on campus. There have been many campus engagement programs created by the Center for a Sustainable Future, and some of them have been very successful in building a more sustainable campus culture, such as composting program, IUSBs, campus recycling, and tops off. These programs teach students the importance of sustainability and encourage them to be more sustainable on campus and in their communities. A peer-to-peer -peer education program that utilizes work-study students to teach their peers about sustainability issues like waste reduction and energy conservation through fun, personal, community-building events, competitions, and campaigns would also build upon current campus engagement. The University of Rochester has a peer-to-peer -peer education program called EcoReps that is successful or successfully recruiting and utilizing students to be peer-to-peer -peer educators. University of Rochester is building a strong sustainable campus culture by utilizing their incoming freshman students that are interested in promoting change. Eco reps are taught sustainability through eco rep classes. They are also guided by upperclassmen that are experienced in on campus environmental efforts. Eco reps teach other students about environmental issues like waste reduction and energy conservation by planning dorm room activities and events. IU South Bend could gain social, environmental, and economic return on investment with a peer-to-peer -peer education program building upon current campus engagement. Sustainability issue number three relates to public engagement. According to Dr. Gail McGuire, director of the Center for Community Engagement at IU South Bend, there are no community service programs aimed at public engagement and serving the South Bend area community. However, the Center for Community Engagement does support faculty and supplies training for all faculty. There are also courses with public engagement projects taught on campus. With additional faculty added to the sustainability department, there would be, a more, there would be more opportunities for students to engage in community through course-related group projects that benefit local businesses and community members by helping them learn what sustainability is and how they can be more sustainable. Campus would also benefit from creating a community service program utilizing students in a variety of community service activities 
that will build on the current level of community engagement, as well as making IU South Bend a stronger community leader. Sustainability issue number four relates to planning and administration. Sustainability is not currently addressed as an issue in the 2014 to 2020 IU South Bend strategic plan. With current scientific evidence that climate change is a growing issue caused by human activities, IU South Bend should seriously consider addressing campus sustainability issues in future strategic plans. It would also be beneficial if IU South Bend added climate action plan goals to the upcoming strategic plan and align those goals with the City of South Bend's climate action plan goals. The return on investment would be better assessed as the action plan was developed. However, given our current global issue of climate change caused by human actions having a negative economic, social, and environmental impact on our local community, developing and adding a climate action plan to IU South Bend's future strategic plan will have a positive return on investment. Sustainability issue number five relates to greenhouse gas emissions. Based on IU South Bend's energy bills, IU South Bend purchases all required electricity for campus operations from fossil fuel sources. Many of the lights throughout campus are lower performing fluorescent or incandescent, which have shorter light average life spans and require more energy to operate than smaller, higher performing fluorescent and LED lights. IU South Bend has an opportunity to reduce energy consumption and by doing so, reduce campus greenhouse gas emissions and carbon footprint. This can partially be done by switching from the current low performing fluorescent and incandescent lights to higher performing fluorescent and LED lights throughout campus. In addition, having lights turned off while rooms are not being occupied will further reduce IU South Bend's energy usage, greenhouse gas emissions, and carbon footprint. Shown in Figure 2, IU South Bend currently uses an average of 1,186,921 kilowatt hours of electricity per month. Shown in Figure 3, IU South Bend currently spends an average of $107,968 on electricity per month. The University of Boston implemented an outdoor light rough retrofitting program in which they replaced their old metal halide bulbs with more energy efficient A19 light emitting diode LED bulbs on the outside of their campus buildings. The University of Boston stated that the A19 bulbs have an average lifespan of 25,000 hours, while their previous old halide bulbs had an estimated lifespan of only 2,500 hours. That project was part of a larger energy savings project that included retrofitting interior lighting fixtures with more efficient fluorescent bulbs across their campus. The University of Boston stated, since the sustainability initiative began, 14 light retrofitting projects have been done across 12 locations. Based on the University of Boston's report, their retrofitting projects have reduced their campus energy usage by 10 to 15% and created a savings of 5,794,800 83 kilowatt hours per year and 2,706 metric tons of CO2 per year, which equals 497 cars or 69,385 trees. The University of Boston also stated that as a result of the lower maintenance needs, their maintenance staff was able to spend more time focusing on other university maintenance needs as well as other sustainability projects. IU South Bend could reduce campus electricity usage and lower the average amount spent per month on electricity by as much as 10 to 15 percent. 
IU South Bend could further reduce electricity usage by fostering habit changes and a conservation-minded culture by implementing a campus-wide initiative to ensure the lights are turned off in rooms that are not being occupied throughout the campus. In conclusion, if all five sustainability issues were addressed, IU South Bend would have a stronger sustainability campus community, reduce the carbon footprint, and enlarge the sustainability program, attracting more students, increasing enrollment and retention rates, have a strategic plan that leads to a more sustainable future, and build a more community-based campus. IU South Bend stands to place itself as a change agent and sustainability leader in the South Bend area community, leading by example. This will also help local businesses and community members by teaching them why sustainability is important and helping them to move towards becoming a more sustainable community. Thanks, Tony. That's a lot of Thanks. data for us to all to process. I don't know if everybody else is like, whoa, my goodness. Um, but uh, as I'm seeing some questions start to come in from viewers, I'm wondering, just from the class, you've heard a little bit about this project almost every week uh, over the semester. Um, what did you just find out that maybe you didn't know beforehand that uh, you thought was really compelling or motivating? I mean, I guess you could guess how much energy a university uses in a month, but like that's huge. And so I think it was really interesting that you addressed the fact that like something like why do why does anybody leave lights on when they're not in a room like something as small as that could make a huge difference and that's super obvious in the data, but not something that everybody thinks about. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's a big stunning a piece of data, Maureen, that um, has been stunning uh, a lot of people as they've been learning about it. Um, but it also, I think you've pinpointed something that's probably the hardest thing to change and that's our habits. And I know we've been talking about that in sustainability classes, probably since you first took your first one is, um, well, that's great. Yeah, you should turn all the lights off and unplug everything every night, but that's living your life very differently. Um, and just like going zero waste, um, it takes practice and thought and it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, it can totally happen, uh, but habit changes uh, are, are tough. Uh, but with th those kind of dollar figures hanging there, you'd think that'd be pretty motivating, right? Um, other people's impressions, what did you just learn that you had not known before? Apparently you've taught them well, Tony, they knew it all already. Okay, well, let me look at some questions here. Um, one was about uh, data that you shared. Um, there is uh, the electricity graph. Um, yeah. Curious about the spike in June electricity usage. It's a good point, like there's not a lot of people on campus. Um, was this due to something unusual for that year um, or a repeated pattern across years? Um, I'm not sure. The, uh, the data that I had was um, pretty much just for one fiscal year. And it just showed the um, like per month. And um, I'm assuming that it was uh, dealing with like facilities 
and how they operate. And since they have more time in the summer, they might utilize more, um, I don't know, they might be doing a lot of projects in the summer when the students aren't uh, on campus and that might have uh, used more energy. But I, I don't know, I'm not sure um, why that spike was there. So you basically looked at, at one year of data, not multiple years compared. Correct. Yeah, okay. I only had one uh, one fiscal year of data to do um, to utilize for um, most most of the information that I have. Um, this is uh, the stars report that we're um, uh, currently doing is um, creating a baseline for us that we can use to work toward a more sustainable future. So. Um, it might in some areas look bad. It's not necessarily bad. Um, and it really isn't that bad. Um, I actually expect us to possibly get a gold rating, um, which is a, is a good rating. There's only one other rating that's higher and that would be platinum and very few universities get that. So, yeah. And what year was the, the year of the data for the electricity usage? That's a follow-up question. Yeah, it was the uh, fiscal year uh, 2019. So it was like 2018, 2019, I believe. And the fiscal year goes from, uh, I think, July 1st to June 30, June 30th. So. Yes, that's correct. Um, I'm curious, I'm watching some other things come in. If you could explain, you had five topic areas. Why those five? Um, those five uh, areas were, um, they seem to be the most, um, the easiest to, to address at, at, um, at this point. And with the unique um, like situation with um, IU South Bend, um, which is a commuter campus, um, some of the other areas uh, would be easier to address if you were a if um, IU South Bend was a um, a campus that had a very large um, student uh, population that was resident on campus. Um, as it is now, um, I believe there's approximately 400 students um, that reside on campus. So it, it, it we're a smaller campus, and um, a lot of this stuff doesn't relate to a, a commuter campus. Or, or are easy easily addressed. Thank you. Um, another question that came in, um, they missed the details about the IUSBs. Um, could you share more, please? Um, IUSBs, uh, that's a project that another um, work study student is um, doing. Um, I'm not totally familiar with that. Um, it's It's, it is one of the um, projects that um, I believe we're still trying to um, like get up and going. Um, I know that there were some issues with the bees. Um, we do have some beehives on campus, um, but there was an issue with the bees and I'm not sure maybe Krista can um, add more to that, but I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with that because that's another student's project. Uh, well, I guess just to add on that, um, so IUSBs, that's their Twitter handle, because our bees yeah. have a, they tweet. Um, so you want to check out that for our news about um, all kinds of stuff, a lot of pollinator related stuff, as it were. Um, so there are the beehives that we have on campus, a local um, beekeeper uh, helps take care of those. Um, often uh, a student or two will, will join the beekeeper out there to help take care of them. But we have limited uh, supply of uh, suits. So you don't wanna go out there um, wearing whatever. Um, we don't want you to get stung because um, it, it's likely to happen. Uh, so we have had, um, I think as all beekeepers do, there's a certain percentage of die off every year. Uh, and some beekeepers do good some years and some not so well. Uh, but we do have uh, two hives on campus. I think one was struggling a little bit last fall, but the other one looked good. Um, I haven't heard, they're just starting to get active now, um, but then we're not active on campus right now. So I'm not sure how they're doing um, besides tweeting magically from inside the hive. Um, but we uh, will had planned some um, 
pollinator workshops, a beekeeping 101 and a planting for pollinators workshop that were supposed to happen in late uh, March, early April. Uh, so we're hoping to hold those in the fall. We've got some dates set for those. Um, so hopefully we can be back face to face uh, learning about bees and how to plan for them and take care of them uh, if you're up to that. Uh, because uh, homeowners in South Bend can keep bees in their backyard, uh, but there's certain protocol you have to follow to be able to do that. Um, and of course, just taking care of bees. Uh, maybe that's not something you just wanna jump into. Uh, so we're hoping to have some introductory classes so people can learn a little bit before they, they go for that. Um, yes, I think that's Stay all. Stay tuned for the bee tweets. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, Great, and so the person that, that asked said, I'm getting some bees at the end of May. Um, so they'd like to be involved, so yay. So more people uh, buzzing about pollinators. <laughs> okay, I had to have bad fun today, right? Um, okay, other um, questions about the STARS data? Anybody has um, issues, opportunities? This is posted on the blog, correct? Yes. Okay, I will have to uh, check it out because that was just a lot of information to absorb. Sorry, I was trying to condense <laughs> no, it. Was, uh, you're fine. You're, no, you're fine. So it, it's it's there's a lot more actually, but it's um it's a very very extensive report. Yeah. Oh, you do. Um, I do believe. Don't. Um, doesn't everybody have access to be able to uh, at least see the report? Um, well, when it's um, ours isn't submitted yet exactly, but uh, when it's public, you can see all of them through the um, the Ashi website. I didn't know That's if that correct. was public or 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 not, but for um, anybody that um, wasn't uh, in, in, involved in the um, report itself. Yes, if you go to stars.ashe.org, that's stars.aashe.org, uh, you can find those reports from any campus that submitted them. So you can look at all the Indiana or, you know, Michiana regional schools that have submitted those to see what they're doing. You can look at each category that Tony mentioned and then some, because he didn't cover everything. Um, so uh, locally here, um, University of Notre Dame is, has a silver rating. Uh, Goshen College, uh, I believe, also has silver. Uh, just recently, IUPUI was um, uh, increased their ranking. They were recognized as a gold stars campus, and IU Bloomington uh, is also a gold level campus. Uh, so we're hoping to be the next uh, IU campus to get a report turned in uh, once we reconvene face to face on campus and get that last bit of data pulled in. Uh, we'll be able to uh, have something yet this calendar year. So. It's pretty exciting to see all where we're starting from and what opportunities open up. So, so we have one teach in left, the last teach in of the 50th Earth Month here in South Bend. So uh, that's exciting. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, we've got something on sustainable eating. I think I'm saying that correctly, uh, but I'll let the students that worked on this uh, introduce it as I pull it up. Hi guys. So for our project, we decided to cover the issue of unsustainable eating habits and focused on some solutions to overcoming the issue. Uh, we broke our teaching down into three main parts, which are limiting food waste, um, limiting high carbon foods and limiting food waste. And our teaching will kind of uh, cover ways that you can respond to these unsustainable food habits. And we hope you enjoy. I'm Michael and I'm accompanied by Sarah and Maureen. I uh, hope you guys are all staying sane and, and alive during these strange quarantine times. Um, I wanted to thank you for joining us in this teaching. 
uh, you know, happy bladed Earth Day, happy bladed Arbor Day. Uh, we're looking forward to teaching you guys a little something that you might be able to take along the road and uh, help benefit your own lives. We decided to focus on sustainable eating, um, the issues behind it, uh, benefits with it, and, and how it can really, really help you out. Uh, overall, highlighting the increasing impact on the environment from the food we eat and how it adds to climate change has begun to stand out as a focal point in many lives and communities around our planet. In a world where food can come from thousands of miles away and individually wrapped is a household icon, what does the phrase sustainable eating even mean? So according to the 1987 United Nations Brundtland Commission definition, sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So the concept of sustainable eating means holding each other accountable. It means taking it upon ourselves to purchase and consume food in a manner that is healthy for ourselves <clears throat> uh, and simultaneously being healthy for the planet. It is about closing the system and creating a cycle that balances out the giving and receiving we implement on our environment. Simply stated, sustainable eating means taking responsibility and doing our part to take back control of our degrading environment. So where do we start? <clears throat> so I chose to focus on uh, the pillar of locally sourced foods and local eating. Um, there's a lot of uh, areas that go into this, but basically eating locally sourced food has an extremely positive impact on our environment and on our local economy. It also has immense benefits for the consumer, for the grower, and for the overall community. Choosing to do so is extremely important because the distance that food has to travel from farm to plate is probably the most important factor in determining a food's ultimate carbon footprint. We have all heard of the farmer's market and the community crop trades. We have all seen locally sourced stamps uh, on brand, that is branded on several products at the grocery stores. We've all been witness to a com community engaged food co-op. But what are the true benefits of utilizing these resources? Sharing the reasoning as to why we should take an advantageous effort to purchase and consume locally sourced foods is the first pillar of sustainable eating. <clears throat> Where you source your food truly does matter, guys. Local food is actually healthier for you. It's much fresher and it tastes a lot better. All of these are because the food spends less time in transit from farm to plate, thus it maintains its nutrients and there's not as much spoilage. Um, also, local, eating local food is eating seasonal food. So even though we all wish blueberries were grown, around, grown year round in our area, Michigan, we know that's not the case. So when you purchase blueberries in the middle of winter, that's just adding to a, an increasing carbon footprint. Um, more resources go into these blueberries, they're traveled further. Um, it's just overall not a good system. Another benefit of buying locally grown foods is the benefit of community involvement. I myself am a huge advocate for community engagement and involvement. Um, uh, local foods and local food resources constantly connect people and they create a much more vibrant community. Consumers who eat the local food are able to meet and grow the meat and get to know the farmers and the food producers who make their food and vice versa. Building this sense of trust and relationship with their local farmers and community is the strongest way to get the best and freshest foods possible. <clears throat> so overall, uh, you know, choose to, to grow, to purchase local, choose to utilize your local co-ops, your farmer's markets, your, your uh, local farmer businesses. You know, it boosts your local economy, it uh, influences job growth, e economic growth, and overall it makes a better, stronger community. On to Maureen. All right. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so I chose to focus on um, what a carbon footprint is and also um, meat and dairy and processed food consumption. So we talk a lot about a carbon footprint, but what a carbon footprint actually is, is the amount of carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds emitted due to the consumption of fossil fuels. So simply put, your everyday choices matter when it comes to the health of the planet. You contribute to your carbon footprint in various ways from driving, shopping, to how you eat. Your diet is a great place to start when reducing your carbon footprint because what you eat can contribute to a lot of processes that create carbon, greenhouse gas emiss emissions, waste, and water usage. The average American diet is high in processed foods, meat, and dairy. And shockingly, if everyone ate the way Americans do, fossil fuel would be gone in seven years. 
when it comes to greenhouse gases, agricultural, the agricultural sector is the biggest contributor at around 20% because of all the methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide created by this sector. Eating heavily processed foods like cereal, for example, is burning like a half a gallon of gas. The energy embedded in these types of foods comes from having to further process the grains in order to make them able to be eaten. Eating higher on the food chain is even worse. Looking at this in terms of calories, there are around 68 calories of fossil fuel used to make one calorie of pork. A pig uses most of its energy to stay alive, and only a fraction of that energy is in the parts that we eat. However, when we eat fresh foods like fruits and vegetables, we are able to consume all of its caloric energy. A sustainable, low-carbon diet can still include meat and dairy and processed foods, but in moderation. So when you're shopping and you choose to buy foods like that, just make sure that you're taking a look at the label and making sure, if at all possible, you could get it locally or free range or grass fed and whenever you can to avoid meats like lamb, beef and pork, which are the highest carbon foods. And um, also consider implementing a meatless Monday or doing a vegan day just once a week. That makes a huge difference. And I think that most people are able to do that no matter what their diet. And also you can keep watching and learning about sustainable ways of shopping. And that's all for me. I'll kick it over to Sarah about food waste. All right. Thank you. So food waste is another issue in the way of unsustainable eating and cooking habits that many people probably participate in, likely without ever even realizing the negative impacts that it has on our planet. So food waste is one of those multifaceted issues that really shows the complexities behind our food waste system and how we can work together to improve it. So just to start with some baseline data about food waste, according to moveforhunger.org, 40% of all the food produced in the United States ends up going to waste. If 40% of all food production wasn't shocking enough, our worldanddata.org explains that the world population uses approximately 50% of total habitable land for agricultural purposes alone. The same site also shared that food and agriculture are the largest consumer of water on the planet, as 70% of the fresh water found on Earth was used for agricultural needs in 2014. As well as that, according to foodprint.org, in 2018, the agricultural sector accounted for 10% of all energy consumed, landing at about 10 quadrillion British thermal units. So water, land, and energy, three of our most valuable resources are being used and ultimately just going to waste when the food itself gets wasted. Not only are we wasting these valuable resources, but we're adding to global greenhouse gas emissions by our food waste as well. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization suggested that the carbon footprint of food waste made up nearly 7% of all global greenhouse gas emissions in 2013. That means that 7% of GHGs are being emitted without any benefit to human life at all. It's just from the waste that we produce. So with all this data in mind, it's, it's definitely a lot to think about, but it's clear why we have to start seeking out solutions. These solutions will only really be beneficial if enough people support and advocate for them. So raising awareness on the issue and talking about it like we are today is a, sol is a solution in and of itself. Another solution is eliminating food waste in your um, is eliminating food waste in your daily life by shopping for only what you know you're gonna eat. A creative way to do this is by meal planning, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a couple days at a time and only going to the store for just a couple a couple days at a time. So this way you won't have to really worry about any food going expired in between trips to the store and, and losing out on that food. Another solution is to utilize any food scraps or ingredients that can be turned into leftovers. Finding creative ways to use leftovers like making a whole meal out of the week's uh, leftovers from dinner is a fun way of limiting your food waste at home and promoting um, more sustainable eating habits as well. 
Storing food correctly and learning the difference between the sell-by, best-by, and use-by dates are also really important steps to eliminating food waste. The one that you should actually be paying attention to for expired food is the use-by date. However, many products are still edible after this date. They just won't be at their best quality, but that doesn't mean that they belong in the trash. All right, guys. So we know that may have been a lot of information to retain with, uh, you know, it's a, it's a long spiel, but let's go give you a basic overview of uh, the three pillars we spoke about. One was eating local. So shop your farmer's markets or co-ops. Be aware of where your food is coming from. Uh, it's very, very important. Number two is limit your high carbon and resource intensive foods. So eat mostly foods with short ingredient lists. Avoid the highly processed foods. Cut back on meat and dairy. Um, make as much food at home as you can. And the third one is mitigating or eliminating food waste as much as possible. Buy only what you really need for your household. Um, use your leftovers, store your foods properly, and uh, definitely avoid foods with excess, excess packaging and excess plastics and all that. But overall, uh, you know, on behalf of myself and Sarah and Maureen, we definitely like to thank you guys for coming out and watching our teaching. We hope you learn something from it and you get to walk away with some added knowledge to put in your, put in your, uh, put in your book. Yeah, thank you everybody. We appreciate you watching. Yeah. Thanks everyone. All right. Another data rich presentation uh, and good summary at the end. Um, so as uh, questions start coming in on YouTube, uh, open it up to the class first. Anything that uh, strong impressions, questions that you have, um, clarifications, things you want to ask the group? I have a question. Um, sorry, did someone else? Um, anyway, um, did you look into uh, greenhouse uh, farms as um, like a partial solution or something that can reduce the um, waste from and also like transportation issues of the food? Um, well, I what we were really focusing on, and I don't know if it translates perfectly well through the presentation, but is like how to shop for food. So we we're really focusing on what the consumer sees when they're going into a store and like what to kind of go through to uh, pick out a sustainable item and make a sustainable meal. Uh, we kind of had to like change what we wanted to do because of all the restrictions. But um, so no, I didn't really look into, I mean, I definitely looked up a bunch of stuff about like how farming contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. But um, I guess like part of like in our blog post, we talked about like how um, organic food is usually a better choice, but we also wanted to keep it to um, be available for everybody. So about what to pick when it comes to organic foods and what to pick locally, what's better. But uh, I didn't look at greenhouse farming at all, actually. So I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. <laughs> I do have one question um, while the rest of you are thinking um, that's coming in. Uh, have any of you who gave the presentation, I think, have any of you taken some steps toward purchasing more local, less meat or dairy, or reducing waste? Um, and can you see it making a difference in your life? Yeah, I've actually been trying to eliminate food waste since like my first time taking a sustainability class because that just like the numbers and how much it actually impacts the environment. Learning that has definitely made me save my leftovers, freeze leftovers and use all the food that I buy because it's wasting money, it's wasting resources, if not. So yes, I have taken a lot of the things that we talked about actually try to cut back. I still eat meat, but I limit it to mostly chicken. Uh, so that's low carbon, lower than pig and um, cow. Yeah, so I know Maureen does too. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I definitely, I, well, after the just food class, I tried to change a lot about the way I eat. Um, cause I started to feel like healing food systems was one of the biggest solutions to climate change since the food sector has its hands in so many different places. Um, it affects so many different things. So I, um, I guess it was actually before my first sustainability class, just shortly before that, I decided to go vegan, but it was mostly for compassionate reasons. But taking classes like this, definitely, it solidified me not wanting to have anything to do with animal products. But I understand that that's important to a lot of people. And it's not just about that for everybody. So um, again, that's why we tried to make it be like, this is something that everybody can do even just one day a week. I think that that makes a huge difference. So something that struck me while the rest of you are pondering how to say it and when to say it, I'll jump in. Um, and I'm hoping, I, th I think, Sarah talked at, now I don't remember, I'm sorry, but cereal, oh my gosh, right? Like what's up with that? Why does it have such a, a big footprint? Uh, I think, I mean, that's, that's like a very American thing to eat, right? Like your cereal for, for breakfast, um, uh, but maybe that's not a good idea. If you could talk a little bit more about cereal because it just kind of slid in there and I caught my attention. I'm like, wait, what? Um, and what are we gonna do if we don't eat cereal? <laughs> Right, we were actually kind of, well, Sarah and I were kind of laughing about this before we before we recorded because I read that about cereal and I've heard that cereal is actually one of the number one things that people waste. And I know that when I cleaned out my pantry a couple of years ago, there was an embarrassing amount of like old boxes of cereal and I felt horrible um about how much I had to throw away I recycled the cardboard but I mean it was just a bunch of food that was stale and I threw it away um but yeah it's really really heavily processed and um and I don't know what it uh, what it is I really like cereal but I don't waste it anymore I've learned to change my habits when it comes to buying so I have like one favorite I buy Cheerios sometimes and I try not to do it very often, but I don't know exactly why it burns so much fuel in its processing and why people waste it so much. And I also don't know why it's so good. Maybe Sarah knows. <laughs> well, it, I was thinking it also does come in double the packaging. It has the plastic wrap and then it has the cardboard box. So it's double the amount of waste. Yeah, I think it must have something to do with like the processing of the grains, um, how whatever else they do to it, and then maybe yeah, what they do for packaging because that's a good point. There's plastic and there's cardboard in it. Yeah, Christy, you took mine. I had written it down because I was, I thought that was kind of flooring too. I was like, that seems kind of crazy. I love cereal. I think it's a great snack and breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, but I definitely get that because I looked in my pantry just the other day too. And I was like, where did all these little boxes come from? It's just like the dust at the bottom. And it, I was laughing about it too. Cause when I was little, my mom would mix all the cereals together and she'd be like you guys need to eat all this and I was like I'm not eating all the mixed cereals mom but like looking back I probably should have done that it would have been better but <laughs> it was just funny that you said that that's kind of a good idea I might be into that now but if I was a kid no no way I didn't like the powder at the bottom either so I it's, I kind of would stop eating something when it got to the end because if there was like a bunch of powder in the milk it would mm, no Maybe that's why we waste so much of it. I only did, I didn't mind the powder of uh, Lucky Charms at the bottom. That's not bad. So speaking of food scraps, um, I know I've been uh, hearing from people uh, right now while you know, maybe not going to the grocery store that often. Um, and Sarah, I know you made the point of like, hey, you know, just go every few days and just get what you need. Um, we're really not doing that right now because we don't wanna be around 
people <laughs> if we don't have to. Um, so there's been a lot of really interesting recipes and creations. I'm wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about sustainable eating uh, tips we might have right now in terms of food scraps, like the um, uh, idea of like, well, what do we have? Let's turn it into dinner. Um, what kinds of things could we do now instead of having to go out to the grocery store, but still um, eat well and, and waste less? Look for the things in your pantry that aren't expired or going to expire. Uh, I know I've been eating a lot of spaghetti because, you know, that does last a long time. And I think I had some in my pantry from even before when all this happened. So um, using, yeah, using what you already have, if you're not able to go to, to the store, it's definitely important. Um, I'm sure that there's lots of stuff back there in your pantry and your freezers, um, making some sort of a uh, concoction from all that it can be fun. <laughs> We have, I have done that at my house uh, in the last week or so. Well, my husband did. He's better at that. He's like, well, what do we got? And so he's like going through the pantry and it was good. It, it turned out it was, it was chicken and chicken thighs, I think. And you just put some random stuff together and it turned out good. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And I think now, even though we're telling people not to eat processed foods, like that's kind of a staple for some, I mean, that's a staple for a lot of people all year round, but like right now, especially, I know I have a lot of canned stuff. And um, so like, I guess that's, you know, that's definitely better than going to the grocery store at this point. So utilizing those kind of staples in your pantry. Um, but also, yeah, we kind of do a creative, like, I don't know, we had rice one day and then something else like that involved a bunch of vegetables a different day. So just throwing that together. And my boyfriend is also pretty good at that kind of thing, just throwing stuff together with leftovers. And after we cleaned out the fridge together a long time ago, we decided to like change our ways when it came to leftovers. So we're a lot more mindful about what we're leaving in there for a long period of time. So we usually make a pretty good conscious effort to use our leftovers rather than let them rot in the refrigerator. Well, I should mention just in conclusion, a couple of um, extra thank yous um, and recognitions that, that um, uh, helped us all with these projects and ideas and concepts. Um, uh, but before I get to that in this last team, um, what is being put into play, I should mention. Um, so Michael is not here, but he was in that last presentation already recorded. Um, uh, he, as well as a couple other people in this class actually, are doing um, local urban agriculture projects for summer internships. Uh, so starting to really learn how to grow stuff, how to teach about it, um, develop new practices and new insights and, and build new networks in terms of sustainable food systems. So um, it's, uh, he's at a, a new, um, farm education CSA program that's in Elkhart. It's called Bushelcraft Farm. They're just starting up. It's their first season. So they are, um, they have CSAs for sale. You can also come out and help and volunteer, social distanced, and um, they're going to do some education programs once they're able to bring people together. So he's starting to do that. Um, and Trace and Abby I'll also doing some projects. You want to say real quick where you're at and what you're doing, and then I'll get to thank yous and we'll wrap up. I'll go first. Um, I am doing my internship with Seed to Feed out in Elkhart under the community church, church community services, sorry, um, based out there. It is, they have 20 gardens throughout Elkhart and one greenhouse that they grow food in, and they use it to uh, feed the food pantry and 
for other things. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to, like you said, like learn how to actually grow the food properly in two different types of environments and most sustainably in both environments. So I'm excited. So I'll be working at the uh, Farming the City, uh, the Bertrand Farm Project at the Good Shepherd uh, Montessori School in downtown South Bend. And uh, they have like CSAs and like different like teaching things that they do with like the young students there as well as community outreach programs that they teach other people like how to farm in their backyards and stuff like that. So I've been doing a little bit already and I, I've liked it so far. Great. Uh, so the other, um, I guess, community partner that I didn't mention earlier, and I apologize that this group is going to be um, working with or supporting, I guess, is um, the local publication Edible Michiana. Um, so they're going to be sending in their um, project and report and materials uh, for them to um, at least edit, which I think will be a really valuable feedback um, for all of them in terms of um, writing about and doing some work and education and awareness on food systems uh, to our local publication that does just that. Um, ideally, uh, getting some uh, public published maybe um, online with Edible Michiana or in print, um, but they're at least going to be looking it over and um, ideally using some of these resources. So this was really developed with that audience in mind. Uh, I also want to thank a couple places that we met as a class. Um, and that is at MNET, uh, which is where Amanda works. Uh, so thank you to MNET for sharing space with us. And also, um, this was kind of interesting. We met at the courtyard by Marriott uh, in one of their um, kind of, I think it's sort of a public space you can use, um, but we were able to use that uh, no charge and had a class downtown one time. So thank you to uh, MNET and Courtyard by Marriott um, and Edwell Michiana uh, and all of our partners that took uh, time out of their lives to share their stories um, and their issues um, and their ideas uh, with all of us. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming out tonight uh, and attending these teach-ins and to all the students for your hard work you put into this. Um, please stay on the line after um, we leave our live stream uh, just for a final wrap up. But uh, any final words or farewells to say to our viewers? Thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for taking time out of your night and watching our <laughs> teaching. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. We need someone. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great last day of Earth Month, uh, the 50th Earth Month. And uh, folks in class, hang on um, to the rest of the world. See you next time. <laughs>